listen to the stories We cried and we laughed Lessons from my history But not of how we go back Cause we strive to move forward A vision of what we can be Full is our circle is you and me and we'll we'll fill it with love and we'll fill it with joy and we'll fill it with pride a vision of what we can be my first and last kids my first and last kids my first and last kids I love you that so much. Welcome everyone. It's great to see all of your faces here showing support for Biden Harris 2020. What a great song and video. Thank you to Stephen Blanchett for allowing us to use it today to inspire us as we all come together in support of a vision for our future. Stephen said that the song is titled Our Stories and he calls it a love song dedicated to all of our ancestors and to future Alaska Natives to come. I'm Carrie Irwin Brown. I'm your moderator for this afternoon's virtual village gathering hosted by Alaska Native voters for Biden Harris 2020. I'm Koi Khan Athabaskan from Nenana. I'm a tribal member of the Nenana Native Tribe and a board member for Tagatili Corporation, which is the Inksa Village Corporation for Nenana. Anabasi for joining us today. 
Over the next hour, we'll focus on presenting important Alaska Native issues that will also be discussed at the AFN convention later this week. Our goal today is to learn how the Biden-Harris policies will impact our community and issues that are important to us, including healthcare, education, economic development, infrastructure, climate change, and more. Now we know there are many, many more issues that we just don't have time to address today. So we encourage you to engage with the campaign and find out more about Joe Biden's commitment to Native Americans and Alaska Natives. We welcome several members of the Biden-Harris campaign today, as well as a panel of Alaska Native leaders who will ask questions of our guests, and then we will open up to questions from participants. Until that time, participants will be muted, so please hold your questions until we open up the chat room, and then we'll um, coordinate from there. And now we're gonna kick off our gathering with a land acknowledgement by Denina Elder, Deborah Call, followed by a short story to ground us for a discussion by Anna Elder, Fred John. Thank you, Carrie. It's, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my land acknowledgement is to introduce myself and Denina. Yali Ashlanda Shashida Deborah Call. Yi Denina Kanikat Nuatana Ishlan Kakali Ishlan. What I've just said is my name is Deborah Call and I am Denina from the village of Kanik and I belong to the Fishtail Clan. So welcome to this virtual meeting being held here in Anchorage on the ancestral lands of Denina. It is an honor to have you here to discuss these important issues that will be coming forward, particularly with this upcoming presidential election. Um, with that, I'd like to um, acknowledge and welcome Fred John to our meeting. He is the storyteller today, as Carrie had mentioned. He's the son of a subsistence fighter for rights, uh, Katie John, and his mother, Katie fought for all of us who were facing the loss of food security in Alaska. After she passed, Fred carried on his mother's legacy by walking many miles from Dot Lake to Anchorage, Mentasta to Fairbanks, Valdez to Fairbanks, to uphold his mother's legacy of raising awareness of our subsistence needs. Probably on his long walks, he thought of the stories that his elders told him. Fred has come to be an accomplished storyteller and he has a story for us today. Uh, Fred, I open up the mic to you, and you can unmute him, please. There you okay, go. Okay, uh, yeah, this is Fred. I just thank you for inviting me to be on here, and I'm just going to tell you a short story uh, about her and what we stood for and our way of life, and this is our, for our health, too. My parents and other parents in surrounding village live off the land. As a child growing up in the remote village of Mentasa, the land was good to us. The sky was good to us and the creeks, lakes and rivers. It supplied us with all our needs. We respected the land and because of that, the land gave back. We were not a lawless people. We had our Indian laws. We followed. We know when to hunt, when to fish, we know not to go after a mother when they have little ones. My mother, Katie John, was a silent witness to new laws on hunting, trapping, and fishing that were, that were put on us by the federal government, making my parents outlaw in their own land. Yet my parents welcomed complete strangers into their homes, those that came up from the lower 48 and tried to make a living in what they named the last frontier. My mother, Katie John, would make them feel welcome by giving them moose skin, gloves, and mukluk. That was part of our Indian law we shared. Sometimes when need arises, we take game out of season to survive. According to the new laws, we were criminals, but we used every part of the animals. According to our Indian laws, we shared. We were not ignorant people who need to be told how to manage our fish and wildlife. We never brag about the animals. We take or hang antlers on the wall. We cared about what the land give and not hoard. That is our way. This is the reason Katie John fought so hard for her children, her village, her people. 
She fought for who we are as a people. She fought to make us proud for who we are. After we were taken away to boarding school and beaten for speaking our language, after all that, she never became bitter. She still taught us to continue to give and share from our heart and not just take. She knew if love is not in this, it will not work. Our politician here use our ways to promote Alaska, yet has no real respect for our ways. We are real people, not museum peace. We are still here trying to live how we were taught and with love. Can we get the same treatment from our politician that's representing us here in Alaska now? To Joe Biden or Uncle Joe, we know your heart and we thank you for it and happy you're there for us. Thank you. Anabasi, thank you so much. What a beautiful message and a great way, I think, to start our conversation. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing your wisdom with us today and your knowledge. I'm now excited to move into our panel discussion. Again, thank you for grounding us, Fred. I want to welcome our guests from the Biden-Harris campaign and our Alaska Native Leader panel. From the Biden-Harris campaign is Clara Pratt and Raina Thiel. For our panelists, we welcome Valerie Davidson, Joe Nelson, and Ruth Miller. Welcome to all of you and thank you for your time to join us today. And I'd like to ask Clara and Raina to each introduce themselves and give brief welcome remarks as members of the Biden-Harris team. First, Clara. Hi, Yadde. My name is Clara Pratt. Thank you so much for allowing me to address you all today. It's just an honor to be here on behalf of the campaign and to share some of the good words and the work that uh, so many people, uh, so many tribal people across Indian country and Alaska and our Native Hawaiians as well have been working on in terms of ensuring that we have uh, indigenous voices in the policies that we put forth for the campaign. So thank you very much for allowing me to be here and say some words. Um, I'm originally from a small town, about 2,000 people on the Navajo Nation. I've had the distinct pleasure and honor of visiting the great state of Alaska, including some interior areas um, over the last several years. So uh, just really appreciative and uh, thanks for the time. Pass it to Raina. Hi everybody, it's so great to be here. Thank you so much for including me in today's exciting um, event. I'm here speaking as a former Obama Biden administration official and someone who's been uh, supporting the Biden campaign in every way that I, I possibly can. Um, you know, this election is such an important one and I know that um, all of us have seen, you know, what the, the wrong leadership can do to our country and to the things that we really care about. Uh, so it just, you know, it's been an honor to be able to work um, with the campaign and to help again in the ways that I'm able to help out. Uh, I'm originally from Alaska. I'm from Bristol Bay. Um, I'm in, in Athabasca and Yupik from Pedro Bay Village as well as Alexander Creek. Uh, so it's uh, really fun to see so many friendly faces and friends here today and can't wait to get a little bit into um, what Joe Biden's plan is for our country and for um, Alaska and how he will, you know, really strengthen tribal sovereignty, will work with uh, Alaska's native people every step of the way to build a prosperous future. So it's great to be here. Thank you both for being here. I'm now going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and briefly, and then I'll present the first question to the, to the guests. Um, we're going to start with Valerie, followed by Joe, and then Ruth. Hi, everyone. Huing and Horalu, who are Miss Lamaran and Liu, you be who are Mamparis of you, Annika, Queen of New York, Attica, Cassel, or Portrait, Washington, or New York. Huing, I think it out, or hide out, or just not Higgins out, or Kekwan out. Good afternoon. My Yupik names are Nukharalok and Amisha Maranan, and my English name is Valerie Davidson. I'm originally from Bethel. My mom's family is from Gujinok on the coast. 
My father's family is Kassak or not Yupik, and they're from Port Orchard, Washington. It's also adopted by the Jackson family about 10 years ago from Cake, and they are both Linket and Haida. And I was given the Haida name Jashna Higgins, which I'm told means noisy lady. <laughs> Carrie, did you want me to ask my question now or come back to it? Yeah, go ahead and go with your first question, please. Okay, Goyana. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, uh, that the fact that today I'm not in Bethel, I'm on Dena'ina lands, and I want to also pay tribute and honor the Dena'ina people who have been incredible stewards of this land for time immemorial. And um, we, take that, we take that responsibility for continuing their, their good work very seriously. So Alaska has incredibly innovative health programs. Um, one thing that's really wonderful about Alaska is we just, we figure out a challenge and we rise to the occasion every time. And right now we have over 40 certified uh, Alaska Native dental health aid therapists who are mid-level dental providers who are trained in Alaska and they are now providing oral health care to over 40,000 Alaskans in rural communities. And we have cavity-free kids in our communities for the first time since contact. Um, this program was authorized as a part of the Indian Health Care Improvement Act, and the IHS is actually nationalizing um, all of the health aid programs, community health aids, behavioral health aids, and dental health aid therapists, which we think is wonderful. Um, unfortunately, though, the Alaska Dental Therapy Program, the training program, is the only health aid program in Alaska that's not currently funded by the IHS. Um, at the time, I think there was a lot of opposition from the, dent from the ADA and the established dentistry, which has, um, which has really gone away. And my question is, what will the Biden-Harris team do to ensure that the Alaska Health Aid Training Programs are fully funded by the Indian Health Service um, before expanding to other states. Great, I can take that one, Rena, if you'd like. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for the question. I think it's an important question. Um, the Indian Health Service, which we all know has been underfunded for decades, and it's the only major federally funded healthcare provider that does not receive advance appropriations, which is um, just you know, shocking even, even today. And it also does not receive significant mandatory funding. And it's the only major federally funded healthcare provider uh, that does not have mandatory nor advance appropriations. Um, IHS consistently faces the uncertainty of the federal budget process. Many of us know who depend on IHS that it's not uncommon as we get to the end of the fiscal year for uh, surgeries that are non-emergency surgeries or, or healthcare to get pushed off until a continuing resolution is, is passed. Um, so what Joe Biden has called for is he's called to dramatically increase funding for Indian Health Service, but also to make that funding mandatory. And then to speak directly to the DHAT training program that you reference, he's also called on Congress to immediately enact Senator Harris's bill that creates a ta task force to address racial disparities. And in addition, he's also called on his new administration to be that um, we will work collaboratively with the process that has been laid forth by tribal representatives in the DSTAC process or the Secretary's Advisory uh, Group that has for years been putting forth um, the shortfall amount that they need to adequately service their IHS areas. Um, and this program would fall under, under that. And um, what he's asked for is for us to collaboratively work together to make sure we identify the dollar figure that's needed to fully fund and mandatorily fund IHS. Um, Raina, I didn't know if you have anything else to add on to that. Yeah, I think you covered a lot of it, Clara. I, I think the one thing that um, kind of bears repeating here is that uh, the commitment to dramatically increasing funding for Indian Health Service and also making it mandatory that those are incredibly important and very historic announcements um, no presidential candidate in history has ever agreed to, um, no major party candidate has ever agreed to making that, that funding mandatory. It's something that tribes uh, have been asking for for a very long time. 
And so the fact that um, Vice President Biden has committed to doing that is, is a huge, huge win. And of course, it'll, it'll take the cooperation of Congress and um, a, a number of things, but just having that commitment is hugely uh, historic for Native people and for the future of Indian health. Um, so just wanted to add that. Oriana. Okay. You know, one, one thing I'm sorry I forgot to mention was um, in the plan, it's also acknowledged that the Indian Health Service does not have enough doctors or nurses. Um, it's difficult to uh, attract and retain as well. So what uh, Vice President Biden has proposed is expanding the reach of the IHS programs designed to provide scholarships and practical experience to individuals to willing to work in high demand areas um, while training health professionals that reflect the community. So we really want to see more indigenous doctors and healthcare providers that are, um, you know, getting educated and coming back to tribal homelands to serve their own community. And, you know, we've seen that that's a very successful model. So we want to make sure we expand that as well. Koyana. Great. Thank you all. What a great question, Val. Super important to us. Now we're going to move to Joe, and if you could just um, introduce yourself, Joe, and then go right into your first question. Sure, thank you, Carrie. My Klinkin name is Kahuku. My English name, you can call me uh, the other Joe. I am coming to you from the Klinkin territory down here, the home of the Akwan who are gracious enough to uh, allow the state government to make this place home, the capital city here in Juneau. I um, also, my, my day job here is I chair the Sea Alaska board and I'm very happy to be here. My, my, my question here, I'm gonna say gunashish and uh, onabasi to Mr. Fred John. I'm gonna give you an opportunity here to uh, the Biden Harris team to respond. Uh, you know, we're all about economic development, but for as native people, a big part of that is is feeding ourselves and our families uh, uh, using the resources around us. And it's always been a priority and it's going to continue to be a priority forever, uh, not just to put food on the table because it's so, but it's so core to our identity, uh, the, to manage the land, uh, to, to harvest, to, to hunt, to fish. And as a lot of you might know, right now, the state of Alaska has us tied up in the courts again and a struggle over subsistence. Uh, and this one, the issue is we have a couple of tribes that are working with the Federal Subsistence Board to provide uh, community hunts during this pandemic. Trying to feed, you know, just working to feed our communities, take care of our own. And the state of Alaska uh, has us um, tied up in the courts with the Federal Subsistence Board and a couple of our tribes. So my question for the Biden-Harris team here is, how will Biden-Harris help ensure that our grandchildren are able to hunt, to fish, and to harvest from our lands just in perpetuity. We've been wrestling with ANCSA, we've been wrestling with the Compromise NOCA for a long time, and we're still in the courts uh, just trying to fight to harvest our own fishing game and wildlife. Uh, we, we, we're really hopeful that we can find a more enduring solution. Do you want me to take that, Raina? Um, I can I can start us off, and then I'll let Clara fill in the um, all the important details here. But um, I have to kind of preface it with you know back in 2015, President Obama uh, and his administration organized a trip to Alaska. I was able to uh, help lead that trip, um, and much of that trip was really focused on subsistence, um, on hunting and fishing, on climate change and those impacts and how it's. Um, negatively impacting food systems in Alaska. And so this over time has always been an important priority for the Obama Biden administration. And I am very confident that that will continue to be a significant priority for Vice President Biden as he goes along. In terms of his um, upholding of tribal sovereignty and of, uh, of course, the rights to hunt, fish and gather, uh, he's been very clear about that over time. It's something he's committed to. He's also committed to ensuring that our public lands are safeguarded as well with the 30 by 30 initiative, which seeks to um, uh, ensure that at least 30% of the US lands are, are protected in some sort of protected status, including the possibility of having 
um, tribally protected areas, so areas that are actively managed um, by tribes and by Native people, uh, which I think is a really, you know, revolutionary and um, amazing commitment that he has made. And so I think um, looking at his record, looking at the history of the Obama Biden administration, you can see that they have that um, they have that support for that issue. They they value um, our ways of life and they ensure that you know we're able to uphold uh, tribal sovereignty and our our subsistence rights in Alaska and, and across the country. So I think that in terms of what he will do, that it will be all positives and that he's really committed to working in a consultative manner with um, tribes and with Alaska Native entities of all sorts. You know, we have a much more complicated system uh, up in Alaska and he's cognizant of that and understands that, you know, it's, it's um, going to take a lot of conversation and consultation with um, different entities. That's exactly right, Raina, and I'll just expand on that a little bit. Um, first, I think subsistence ways of life and traditional ways of life for Native people um, is so critically important, and the Vice President understands that, um, and certainly being able to practice traditional ways of um, surviving and of providing for ourselves and passing on that knowledge to the next generation is just it can't underscore the importance of that. Where that has the nexus with the federal the federal side of things is having an administration that understands the importance of that, that doesn't want to diminish that, um, and has called to um, have adequate representation. Re representation matters. Certainly when Reina was in the White House and you had voices of tribal people at all levels of government, you see the difference that that makes in federal law and policy. Um, and as President, uh, President Biden, soon to be President Biden, has committed to appointing people um, like Raina, like myself, like, like all these people on this panel here today um, that are subject matter experts and that know um, federal laws and policies. And particularly for Alaska, because um, the status through ANCSA is so different, um, because it, it, it takes a specific type of understanding to understand the difference between um, treaty, trust, federal responsibility, the things that are outlined in ANCSA, the structure of the tribal villages along with the regionals, um, and you need to have people that, that understand that, that get that, and are committing to and will continue to have that dialogue with sovereigns, um, whatever, however they uh, are, are organized, right? And I think that that's really important, particularly for our Native peoples in Alaska, that they have that, that voice and that direct line um, to ensure that they are able to hunt, fish, and harvest um, as we have since time immemorial. Um, so putting back in place the Tribal Nations Leadership Summit or Conference, and then putting back in place people that look like our communities and have expertise in our communities, I think that will go a long way into ensuring that we are able to sustain our traditional way of life for the long term for as long as we want. So thank you for that question, it's a great question. Thank you, and now we're gonna move to Ruth Miller. Ruth? Yachli Duj, Unahi Dinenu, everybody. As Chivaik is Sanch Ijit, U Ruth Miller, Gustanish Iji, then in a Kanaka Shatkun Kanash, a Kukas Nanchugus Kayaki Landa, a Degay Kak, Suguya Studach, U Chariangas Nanash Ite, Chiknekaliki Diki. My then in a name is Chivaik Isen, and my English name is Ruth Miller. I'm the daughter of Heather Kendall Miller and Lloyd Miller, and the granddaughter of Jack Ferguson and Ruth Peterson, and Arthur Miller and Hope. Simon. Um, my family is from the native village of Ikuk and a little bit farther upriver from the Lake Clark area with some roots in Bristol Bay as well. So I'd like to acknowledge our uh, tribal leaders and our native elders who are here in this space with us. I wish we could be gathering like a real big village meeting, uh, but I'm grateful to see so many mentors and elders uh, sharing this space with us today. And so I'm here representing uh, not just Indigenous youth, but also um, uh, I, I work, my life's work is, is as a climate activist, as, as a land and water protector. And um, I think that the most pressing issue facing our Indigenous youth today is the advent of climate chaos, particularly in the Arctic. Here in the circumpolar north, we are experiencing the climate crisis at disproportionately more advanced and severe rates. And our youth are uh, 
um, you know, mobilizing to change the paradigms that have led us uh, to depend on an extractive economy. And so as we come to age in our leadership, um, I, I believe that climate change is the most pressing issue for, for young people and particularly young people. Um, and that means not just here on the ground, but also in policy. Um, there's been much debate about what public policy will be needed in the next administration to address our climate crisis. Um, and the Green New Deal has risen in support and collaboration from grassroots leaders to environmental organizations. Uh, how does the Biden plan for urgent global action on the environment differ from the Green New Deal and how do, what do the two plans share in common? Great, thank you for that question. Um, in the plan, we, we address specifically climate change and the, the real existential threat to Native communities that climate change presents. Um, it poses particular threats to our tribes, especially those that have had to relocate from erosion and rising sea levels uh, on the coast. 40% of federally recognized tribes live in Alaska where the melting sea ice and permafrost are um, damaging the necessary infrastructure and harming communities. I think that um, the, you folks in Alaska really have a front row seat to the true and real impacts of climate change today, what's happening now. It's not 10 or 20 years from now, it's, it's facing communities now. So what we have proposed is to achieve net zero emissions economy-wide by no later than 2050. So when you're, when you're comparing and contrasting the new Green Deal, um, there are some differences, but in terms of calling for net zero emissions by 2050, um, making sure that we have a resilient and aggressive plan to reduce emissions, um, to bring infrastructure to Indian country specifically and to tribal communities that are part of that clean energy production and use piece, is really important. I mean, we could we could shift everything away from extractive resources and the fear there for many of our tribal communities, including my own, is what does that mean for the economic well-being um, when you're dependent on things like oil and gas and coal leases? Well, we need to make sure that we have a, a safety net and a plan in place to support communities that want to transition to clean en the clean energy economy, which we're saying all of it by 2050 should be net zero emissions. But you can't just cut it off without the support necessary to help these communities and these economies transfer over. In my home community here on the Navajo Nation, um, we had the dirtiest, largest coal-fired power plant uh, west of the Mississippi, and that's the Navajo Generating Station. Over 30% of our income that was non-federal was generated from this power plant. We finally closed that power plant last year, and it was something that had that Everybody said, economists and people on the other side in the industry said, it can never be done. You guys will fail. This will not happen. Well, that didn't happen. You know, we're still here. We're still surviving. The coal plant is gone and our air is cleaner and we're better off for it. So, you know, being able to work collaboratively with communities, um, it's possible and we can do it. And I know that with this plan uh, that we have that specifically calls out the need to support tribal communities as part of this clean energy economy, um, is going to make a huge difference for not only ourselves and our lives, but our children and their children. Thank you. And I'll just add on a little bit to that. Um, I think you covered a lot of it, Clara, in your remarks, but um, climate change is obviously a top issue for uh, Vice President Biden. He you know, has been talking about climate change for a long time. He's been working to combat climate change for a long time, including uh, when he was Vice President to uh, President Obama. Uh, I talked about 2015 when President Obama came to Alaska because uh, for the Obama-Biden administration, climate change was also a top priority. And so when he came up, up to Alaska, he really made that a focus of what he was there to talk about. And not just climate change, but the impact of climate change on Native communities in particular. Uh, he met with, with Native leadership. He traveled to uh, rural communities, Kotzebue and Dillingham. Um, and so, you know, really they've, they've, they've manifested that uh, prioritization of uh, fighting, fighting climate change. And I know with Vice President Biden, there's been a lot of talk about, um, you know, the Green New Deal, which he thinks is a crucial framework for um, meeting our climate challenges. 
And there aren't, I mean, there are some differences, but it's kind of hard to compare apples to apples because uh, the Green New Deal is more kind of a, a lofty ideals type of a statement, whereas the plan that um, Vice President Biden is currently committed to is kind of step by steps, like what is the, what are the nuts and bolts of how you get there? Um, and one of the things that he has, uh, has done is to create kind of a dual focus on climate change and environmental justice. So pairing those two together, it's like right there in the title of his plan. And he's committed to, um, you know, the $2 trillion that he's committed to put into this effort over four years, which is a huge, huge um, commitment. He has uh, stated that he will, you know, direct 40% of that spending to historically disadvantaged communities and uh, indigenous communities to tribes to native communities uh, across the board so that they, those who are dealing with the most severe impacts of climate change will um, be able to to combat it in their home communities. So uh, I'm extremely confident. I mean, climate change is one of the top issues for me as well, just on a personal basis. So um, I'm certainly happy with where he is and, and how he plans to approach it. Both of you, thank you so much for your thoughtful responses. Thank you all for your great questions. This was a really meaningful conversation. Um, with that, I'm going to ask that we open it up for audience questions. So if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat box or raise your hand and we'll try and call on you and unmute you. Um, and maybe, I think Veronica's gonna help me with this, but until we see those come in, um, if I could, Val, I'd like to go back to you and have you present your second question to the guests. Sure, Oyana. Um, so uh, clearly um, your commitment to healthcare and your access to healthcare is something that you have a proven track record on. I know that um, because of your commitment to healthcare and the Affordable Care Act, um, over 60,000 Alaskans today now benefit from Medicaid expansion, which is huge. Um, another way, um, in fact, one of the most effective ways to be able to improve a family's health status is to improve their economic status. And education is the key. Can you please share uh, what the Biden-Harris uh, plan is for increasing educational opportunities for Alaska Native people in our communities? So I'm, I'm really excited about this portion of the plan because um, I had been doing some education work um, previous to joining the campaign. So I, I got, I really delved into impact aid and elementary secondary education act. So this, this part of the plan really speaks to my heart. Um, and it, it, there are some statistics that I'll share with you. Um, Native students are more than five times more likely to attend high poverty schools. 41% versus 8% for white uh, counterparts. So what Vice President Biden has committed to is triple funding for Title I of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Triple the funding, which, you know, it's easy to say, but it's, it, the impact will be unbelievable. And what that does is it provides resources for schools to support low-income students. It fully funds individuals with disabilities under the IDEA Act. Um, it's also designed to support children um, across the spectrum. And these programs set aside a portion of funding for the BIE as well. So we're talking both public and BIE funded schools. Most Native students are not in BIE schools, they're in public schools. So we, we wanted to make sure that we're paying attention to both sides of, of that and make sure that whether a student is in a BIE school or a public school, they're getting a quality education. And so we want to support um, students being able to uh, get to exceed and excel in all of these schools. Um, additionally, we want to invest in improving public school buildings, including public schools operated directly by tribes through 638 contract and directly by the BIE. Um, his plan for infrastructure includes a hundred billion investment in the nation's public schools, and it includes a set aside for tribes. Um, and will ensure critical infrastructure needs at tribal schools will be prioritized. Uh, additionally, um, we want to support innovative approaches to recruiting Native teachers, including supporting high school students and accessing dual enrollment classes. 
that give them an edge in teacher preparation programs and help um, prepare them for colleges and universities. Um, the other thing, Biden has committed to protecting fund, funding for the Johnson O'Malley program and ensuring that Native students have access to Native history and culture and curriculum in schools, including uh, tribal language and culture, because we see that when you have students have access to tribal uh, languages and culture, their outcomes across the board improve in all other subject matters as well. Uh, the other thing is once a student leaves school, we want to make sure that we are providing steps to rectify funding disparities faced by tribal colleges. So providing new funding streams for tribal colleges and universities and minority serving institutions and increase college completion by making college affordable for Native students. Um, I, like many people, um, went to school on a Pell Grant. So we want to make sure we uh, double the amount, the maximum value of the Pell Grant, which will increase school affordability for students all over the country that otherwise wouldn't be able to attend school. Uh, the other thing which I'm really excited about is Biden, uh, Vice President Biden said he will immediately cancel $10,000 of federal student loan debt during COVID and forgive all undergraduate tu tuition related federal student debt from two and four year public colleges, including tribal colleges and universities, and for debt holders earning up to $125,000 a year, and also for giving loan payments for individuals making $25,000 or less per year. He's gonna cap loan payments at 5% of discretionary income and fix the public service loan forgiveness program and forgive $10,000 of undergraduate or graduate student debt for every year of national or community service up to five years. So we're gonna have an influx of young folks that are not gonna be hampered down by unbelievable amounts of debt. Three quarters of our native students come out of college just you know, bogged down with insurmountable debt. I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases that they can't get out from under and they just sort of accept they're going to have to pay this for the rest of their lives. So we want to make sure that we give them the tools they need so that they're not coming out of, of college. I mean, they did the right thing. They went to school. They got an education just like we told them to. Um, and yet they're looking at it going, man, I, I, was, I was better off just, you know, doing apprentice work somewhere else. So we want to reverse that, that, that trend and make sure people feel good about going to get an education and they're not going to be hampered down by debt. So there's sort of multiple parts there from birth all the way to graduating through college that we want to support our tribal students. And Clara covered a ton of, of information there and I, I just had a couple of things to, to add, but um, Biden has also uh, committed to ensure that there's broadband access for every native household. Um, he's made that commitment. He is going to ensure that he sees it through. He understands how important that issue is, especially in a state like Alaska, where we have, you know, so many of our communities don't have broadband. You know, I was back in my village this past uh, summer for, you know, for quite a while. And I tell you, it's, it's so hard to try to work remotely or to learn remotely when you don't have broadband access um, and you barely have cell phone service. You know, our, our cell phone service was, was going out, it was kind of touch and go, um, and that's how it's been for a long time. Um, and, you know, that's a, an improvement over where we used to be, which was absolutely no, no access, no connectivity whatsoever. So um, certainly uh, Vice President Biden understands that, that issue and understands how important that is, especially in a global pandemic where folks can't always go to school in person, they're going to need that broadband access. And so he's um, certainly committed to that. One other um, really incredible thing he's committed to, which is a first by a major party candidate, again, is that he's committed to addressing the needs of urban Native people. You know, over half of our population in many circumstances is actually living in urban areas versus in rural areas. So ensuring that, um, you know, there are services and programs and support infrastructure for um, our people, whether they're living in their home community or whether they're living in an urban center is really important. And also his commitment to public school curriculum, native public school curriculum, that's not just for um, majority native student schools, that's across the board. So, you know, the Alaska public school curriculum under his plan would be integrating native curriculum so that every student in this country learns um, an important part of history, which is not often included, which is native history and native culture um, in the present day as well. So um, some very exciting things coming out of his campaign on, on the education front. So we're all very excited about it. Brianna. Thank you. 
It looks like we do have a couple of questions from participants. I'm going to call on Suzanne Fleek Green and then Jerry Hope. Suzanne? Hi, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having this call. I think Raina touched on my question regarding broadband access. I think right now there's even a greater crisis in rural Alaska with COVID and you know, young people not having access to school and not able to have the same kind of online connections, both to their teachers, but also to their friends, to after school programs, because they don't have internet connectivity in their home. So Raina sort of answered my question on that. I would follow up by saying, I thought it was incredibly insightful and powerful when the Obama Biden administration in the first six months of their first term sent five cabinet members to Alaska and went to rural Alaska and really saw on the ground the challenges that we have. Um, and I think that made a lasting impression on those cabinet members and what they were able to um, do while they were in office. and especially on broadband um, and housing and medical care. And so I would encourage something like that again in Vice President Biden's administration because it forms the relationship that this can stay top of mind for folks once they get back to, to Washington. So I guess I'd, I'd ask to um, follow up on, on that, just what the opportunities are to bring people to Alaska um, so that they see for themselves what the opportunities and challenges are in rural Alaska. And then I think back to the broadband, it's really about the urgency um, and what can be done in that first few months of the administration to help connect um, rural Alaska homes um, to the internet because we have we have learning loss right now. So thank you very much again for this opportunity. Thanks, Suzanne. And Claire, I don't know if you had anything else to add on the broadband issue. Suzanne, thank you so much for that for that incredible question. Yes, thank you. And on the broadband piece, I think that people that have never been to rural parts of our country have really no concept of how difficult this, this time has been for, for our, our children and for people who are trying to work from home. Um, you know, it was funny because we had a, a call with Arizona and I think Raina was on that call and one of the former uh, chairmen from the Navajo tribe said, well, hold on, I'm having trouble. I might have to climb this tree, you know, and he's an elder and he said, I might have to climb this tree to get reception, but that's, that's really what we're facing here. And we're expecting our, our kids to um, learn in this environment. So the, the plan has really been to um, expand 5G, at least 5G connectivity across the United States with a particular emphasis in our rural tribal communities, because we've, we're, we've already been behind the curve for so long um, that this is just really, uh, underscored what we're facing. Um, and I think getting people out to our communities is really important. And um, I was fortunate enough to take our former SBA administrator when I was under the Obama Biden administration to Alaska um, for her to understand and to see, because I think one of the, the comments was, well, why can't you do all the work in Alaska? Why, why, do, why do contractors come to other states to do work and why don't you do all the work in Alaska? And we took her up there and she's like, oh, I get it. I see, you know, and, and seeing is believing. So I think having a visit early on would be fantastic because I mean, it's a, it's another world in Alaska. I'm, I'm jealous for those of you who live there because it's beautiful. Um, but yes, there are some challenges in terms of uh, IT infrastructure in particular. Thank you so much. Jerry Hope was next. Yeah, thank you for having me and having this forum. Uh, as identified in my chat, uh, my interest is tribal transportation and tribal transit. Uh, just want to uh, give hats off to the Obama Biden administration on their transportation bill. Uh, prior to that, I was involved with what they called the Tribal Transportation Unity Caucus, which involved 
a number of tribes around the country, including the, us here in Alaska. We put together the um, important pieces for the FAST Act. <clears throat> and we're fortunate that a lot of that, excuse me. <coughs> A lot of that was included in the FAST Act. <clears throat> I see uh, in the Biden-Harris, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, they have put together a, a really good forum or format, excuse me, it includes uh, travel transportation in their, uh, in their plan. It's uh, broad in general, but <clears throat> I did want to point to what the House has put together already in HR2. Uh, I just want to highlight uh, four provisions of the numerous ones. The uh, National Congress of American Indians and the Intertribal Transportation Association have worked together to put together a number of elements of which the House did respond to. Uh, they increased the tribal transportation program and funding from 505 million to 800 million. Uh, they restored the exemption to the obligation limita limitation deduction. Uh, that obligation limitation dedu deduction removed hundreds of millions of dollars from what was then the Indian Reservation Roads Program and into what was transitioned as the tribal transportation program. Uh, they restore the tribal high priority projects and the discretionary grants. And uh, the other one I wanted to highlight is they established an Office of Tribal Affairs into the USD for to oversee the Tribal Transportation Self-Governance Program in the USTOT. Uh, under the Obama-Biden administration, I was one of uh, 15 tribal representatives appointed to the negotiated rulemaking committee that laid out the published rule that establishes the Office of Self-Governance within the USDOT. I am also president of the Alaska Tribal Transportation Work Group and chairman of the Intertribal Transportation Governance Committee. And so we've been doing an awful lot of legwork and coordination with the National Congress of American Indians to put together a lot of detail um, uh, that would transition from the FAST Act to a new congressional bill. Unfortunately, HR2 uh, had been laid to rest in the Senate, uh, and we're hoping that it would uh, get traction, if you will, in, in the Senate, but unfortunately it has not been. Uh, with the uh, Biden-Harris effort, my question is, uh, would they be willing to uh, really have some kind of inclusion in tribes who are in transportation and transit to uh, work on further details to uh, what they've included in their platform. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hope. Uh, yes. The, the, uh, the, FAST, the, the, the FAST Act, the Tribal Transportation Program, and the, the, as previously known as the Indian Reservation Roads Program, has been so, um, has, has taken on many forms over the last 10 years. It's hard to remember. Um, you know, I remember when it was Safety Lou and the FAST and all these different provisions that have come forward uh, over the last 10 years in regards to tribal transportation. Um, and what we've seen under the current administration is a rollback of all of those working groups that had made tremendous headway into figuring out the best way to divvy up, you know, this, this small pie, if you will. So I think the goal there would be to increase the pie overall and then reinstate those work groups of the subject matter experts that are doing the hard work on the ground in tribal transportation particularly. And tribal transportation is so important and just making sure that that, that lifeline of communication and cooperation is happening between the BIA program and the Federal Lands Highway program. Um, and that task force that you had mentioned had been doing a lot of that work, particularly in regards to formula funds and state roads, uh, county roads, 
and uh, large land-based tribes. So there's a lot of negotiation that happens in that, in those discussions. So we'd like to see that dialogue come back into play and subject matter experts like yourself be able to come to the table with what works for your state and your region. And I think understanding the unique challenges um, of transportation in Alaska and, and how roads get built and um, how long they last, et cetera, is so important. And the bridge, the bridge funds as well is, is a part of that piece of it. Um, we saw that there was some success in Tiger grants for specific regions, but they weren't, I don't feel like they were equitable across the board um, because we had tribes competing against uh, larger municipalities and it just wasn't, it wasn't an equal playing field to get the same funding to tribes under things like Tiger grants. So I guess the, the, the long, the short answer or the long answer would be yes, to have those um, subject matter experts from Indian country be reinstated in those working groups so they could help guide the policy decisions that are made because nobody knows these communities like people from these communities. And just to Thank add you, on Clara. a tiny, oh, sorry. tiny, oops, sorry, just a tiny bit there. Um, I, I think one of the things that's really interesting and exciting about uh, uh, Vice President Biden's plan is his plan for resilient infrastructure. Um, you know, he's committing a lot of resources toward that in his climate change plan, which is really exciting. And of course, that coupled with um, a commitment to enhance and to strengthen uh, tribal consultation will ensure that, you know, Native people, we always have a seat at that table in that um, we're getting the infrastructure investment that we need in the way that we want it. So it's not just kind of folks um, bringing a proposal or a plan to our communities. It's our communities really being the powerhouses and the um, leaders behind, behind that funding and behind those projects. Thank you both so much and thank everyone for your questions. This was a really great conversation. Thank you for being here today. We're running out of time. We do have a door prize um, and I think we have a photo of it that we will show you. And we selected the winner from the participant list. So the first person we're looking for is Jennifer B. Is Jennifer B still on the line? I am. Yay. Okay, you're the winner. Win nothing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. Really good, so you guys did a really good job at putting the panel together and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have your information, so we'll contact you to get that to you. Thank you. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn back to Val. We have just two more things that um, should go by pretty quickly, but we have a get out the native vote. A message from Val, and then we'll um, close out with a message from the Biden campaign. Val? Oriana. So I just want to express, Oriana Jaknak, thank you to each of you for your inspiring messages of hope today. And I mean, let's be clear that this national election is really one of the most important elections in our lifetime. As Joe Biden often says, really the battle before us is really for the very soul of our nation. And by electing Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, we really can chart a better course for our future, which our children and our families and our communities deserve. Throughout their distinguished careers in public service, uh, both Joe and Kamala have demonstrated that they embrace hope, not fear, peace, not violence, generosity, not greed, light, and not darkness. Other states, um, you know, what, what our state in Alaska needs and really what our entire country needs and deserves, um, we deserve that change to happen. We're suffering from a pandemic that has really taken a terrible toll on our physical and emotional health. And we've also seen what that has done to our access to healthcare and on our economic well being. Um, here in Alaska, as was mentioned before, we're the first in our country to experience the impacts of climate change. And we appreciate the Biden-Harris plan to address it. You know, at its, at its core, Alaska Native people really want what every other American wants. We want our children to be healthy. We want them to be happy. We want them to be well-educated and we want them to live in safe communities. 
but because of where we live and because of our special trust relationship with the federal government, we have to do things differently in order to achieve that outcome because what works in Atakasuk isn't necessarily what works um, in Washington, D.C. or another um, big city. Today, you know, thankfully, the Biden-Harris team has demonstrated their commitment to tribes and shared comprehensive plans to address these issues and many, many more that we just didn't have time to talk about before. We know that this team is going to put people before politics and they will appeal to the best of us, not the worst. They're focused on the future and how we improve the future for our families, not on the past. Um, and you can look to their national websites and also the Alaska website that will highlight that commitment. So here's a little word of caution. You know, right now the national polls look really good, and, but let's not kid ourselves and be comforted by the progress that we've made in national polls because we've been down this road before. And you know, as Alaska Native people, we know we don't count our fish until they're in the boat and they are smoking away in our smokehouses. And so there is so much more hard work that remains ahead in these final three weeks of the campaign. And we just cannot let our guard down. And we've learned that lesson before. So every single one of us, including your friends, really needs to take very specific action in these three ways. One, vote and make a specific plan for how you're going to do that whether in person or by mail, however you can do that safely. And we vote, encourage you to vote early in person starting October 19 to make sure that your vote is counted on election day. This is not the time to lollygag or wait until the last minute. We don't have that kind of time. Um, please post a picture of your I Voted sticker on social media to remind others to do the same, um, along with the hashtag Alaskans for Biden Harris. Second, Talk to your friends and your family about why you think it's important to, to support Joe and Kamala on November 3rd. We know that personal contact with people that you know and trust is the most effective way to be able to generate support for the Biden-Harris ticket. So talk to your parents, talk to your aunties, your uncles, your grandparents, and your young people. Um, so much so that before you even say anything, they already say, I know I'm voting for Biden-Harris. Feel free to nunuk and just talk to them as much as you'd like. Um, download the Vote Joe app that has information and tools that you can reach out to friends and family. And third, volunteer and show your support for Joe and Kamala. And this includes posting signs in your yard, phone banking, getting on the phone and calling, and sharing your story about why you support the campaign in a short video on social media. And of course, always include the hashtag um, Alaskans for Biden Harris and all of these all of this information I know is a long list you can find it available on Alaskans for Biden Harris.com and if we work hard if we work together restoring the future of this country and our very soul of this country is absolutely within our grasp so let's get those fish in our boats and in our smokehouse and elect Biden and Harris Juliana. yes Perfect message, Val, for us to end on. Thank you so much for that. Check out the chat uh, box, you guys. There should be links and resources listed in there. I believe this is being recorded and will be on the Alaskans for Biden-Harris website later. Thank you, everyone, for your time to join us today. Thanks to our Biden-Harris team guests, Claire and Raina, our panelists, Valerie, Joe, and Ruth, our planning team, Teresa Baldwin, Deborah Call, Sylvia Lang, Ruth Miller, Vicki Audi, supporters, including Stephen Blanchett, Grace and Alex, who are doing all our technical stuff today, Veronica Slager, and the Alaskans for Biden-Harris campaign. And for the wrap-up, as we go out, we'll watch a brief video from Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. I hope to see all of you virtually at the AFN convention this week. Thanks so much. Hi, this is Joe Biden. It's an honor to talk with you at the crossroads, this crossroads moment of our, for our country. And, you know, your voice defines us as our foundation and as our future. Your centuries of sacrifice and service, your resilience, show us the way. But today, across our country, trust is ebbing. Hope seems elusive. Instead of working to heal, we're being ripped apart. And I refuse to let that happen. We have too bright a future.
to leave it shipwrecked on the shoals of anger and division. I said from the start, I'm running to unite this country, to embrace light, not darkness, the future, not the past, to appeal to the best in us, not the worst. This is the most important election of our lifetimes. It's about hope over fear, science over fiction, truth over lies. It's about facing the often hard facts of where we come from and honoring the commitments with action. As president, I'll make tribal sovereignty and upholding our federal trust and treaty responsibilities to tribal nations the cornerstone of federal Indian policy. I'll promote self-governance and self-determination and recognize it. I've outlined a detailed plan to strengthen nation-to-nation relationship, building on the progress we made together under the Obama-Biden administration. It It includes putting more land into trust and protecting our natural and cultural treasures, boosting investments in schools, roads, housing, clean water, and broadband, creating good-paying jobs. You know, it increases funding for Indian Health Service, and families makes that funding, and finally it goes on and makes that funding mandatory so your families benefit. You know, we'll not only follow steps lay, I laid out back in March to beat COVID, which has been three times more deadly for Native Americans. We're going to build back better and end the inequities in healthcare, in education, and opportunity that this crisis has amplified. I commit to you, tribes will have a say in my administration and a seat at the table. Because in these crises today, the ones we face today, we have an enormous opportunity to build a better future if we do it together. So please get everyone out to vote, friends, family, colleagues, your whole communities. Send them to IWillVote.com and make a plan to vote today. We can't ever let anyone think their voice doesn't count because the American people, all of us, will decide this election and define our future. So let's spread the word, spread the faith. Let's get to work. God bless you all. And by the way, God bless all those who serve this country. Former Vice President Joe Biden just released that announcement. Joe Biden is now a 2020 presidential candidate. Biden will enter this race as the front runner. I know Joe. We know Joe. But most importantly, Joe knows us. Candidates coalescing around Joe Biden. His campaign made history. Joe Biden has selected Kamala Harris as his running mate. This is your campaign. Now's the time to fight for what we believe in. The 2020 presidential election is less than two months away. The presidential race is tied. This election is in no way predetermined, and it's going to be close. We have got to vote like our lives depend on it.